Okay, good morning. Uh, we are going to start our main session on digital threat. So please have a seat. Okay, um, good morning again. I'm Kenta Mochizuki, a member of the Mate Seiko Hoda Advisory Group of United Nations Internet Governance Forum and a public policy counselor for America Incorporated, Japanese company. Today, we would like to hold a main session on digital trade titled Promoting Data Free Flow with Trust in a Digitally Connected World, Osaka Track, VR Strategy, and the Future. As we return in our main session page of our IJF interactive schedule, this session aims to facilitate a thoughtful dialogue on how to further promote free flow of data across borders, while addressing the various challenges related to privacy, data protection, intellectual property rights, and security with the concept of trust. This will be done taking into account the progress of digital transformation as well as recent geopolitical and trade tensions which have impacted the global economy. Digital economy has been growing, flourishing continuously with the pervasiveness of ICTs, such as AI, IoT, big data analytics, blockchain, and any other emerging technologies. Now it is not too much to say that digital economy is economy as such. It has been a key driver for innovation and economic growth in both developing and developed countries while changing the traditional ecosystem of the world economy. Because digital economy is based on the internet, which is open and global in its nature, it can easily be expanded globally. Digital economy has a great influence on trade, and there have been a wide variety of trade-related discussions, and the scope of digital trade negotiation has been expanded too. One of the most important and contentious points at issue is about data. And many countries have now been thinking about what kinds of rules and policies are needed to further promote data utilization while protecting it from various perspectives. In principle, it is indispensable to ensure the free flow of data across borders. But at the same time, we also have to think about how to address some challenges like privacy, data protection, intellectual property rights, and security, taking into account cross-border business activities by global digital platformers and their impacts on small and medium-sized enterprises. Speaking of rules and policies, there are many ways to regulate data. That is, it can be a legally binding instrument, so-called software, self-regulation, or even co-regulation with the cooperation of both public and private stakeholders. In this regard, the more countries set legally binding norms to regulate the cross-border transfer of data, the more it gets difficult to facilitate the flow of data, and the businesses have to increase their compliance costs. At the end of the day, world's digital economy could be a patchwork Therefore, international harmonization, as well as the interoperability between states, actors, and the nodes, are at most important. And there have been various negotiations occurring bilaterally, plurilaterally, and multilaterally, like trade negotiation. However, not all decision makers are familiar with technologies and emerging cross-border business activities based on them. They have still been struggling how to achieve the optimal international harmonization and interoperability. Under such situation, multi stakeholder participation plays a critical role, and I believe the IGF is the best place to find ways forward to achieve the optimal international harmonization and interoperability for the facilitation of digital trade. At this time slot, we hold a hybrid style session for the total two hours with distinguished high level speakers and panelists, as well as prominent moderators. First of all, chairs of G20 and G7 this year report on the outcomes 
And, the, and then, high level panelists discuss one policy question based on the reports of both G20 and G7 chairs. After the panel discussion, we open the floor and discuss another question among the audience, speakers, and panelists. Before we wrap, wrap up, we will ask you know, all speakers to make final words. Finally, I'd like to let you know that this May session realizes paragraph 13 in the digital economy section of G20 ministerial statement on trade and digital economy in this June. As a third year MAG member, I am very pleased to hold this kind of a session and hope everyone here will enjoy and learn and learn a lot from distinguished speakers, panelists, and you, the audience. With that, I'd like to leave these opening remarks here and like to pass the button to the prominent moderator, Mr. Paul Feringer. Paul, please stay at your session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenta, for those, um, for those opening remarks and um, for setting the scene for, for, for this session. It's a pleasure to, ma um, to moderate this main session on the future of um, cross-border data flows and trust. Welcome to everybody here in the room, um, remotely as well, and to our great panel. My name is Paul Fenninger. I'm the co-founder and deputy executive director of the multi-stakeholder organization Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. And as Kenta pointed out, how to square the transnational internet and national laws is one of the greatest challenges of the digital 21st century. It is especially moving um, for me personally to moderate this main session on the future of cross data flows and trust here in Berlin, the city in which I was born, and which is such a global symbol and reminder of what impact borders can have on our societies and on our economies. We will talk today about how we can maintain and foster data flows and services across borders in a globally connected digital economy. This issue has propelled in only a few years to the forefront of political agendas around the world. And we have a great and diverse um, multi-stakeholder panel today. With us are Yochi Ida, the chair of the G20 Digital Economy Task Force and the Deputy Director General for G7 and G20 Relations at the Global Strategy Bureau of the Japanese Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. Salva Toko, who's the head of the French Digital Council, the Conseil National Numérique. Mr. Tilman Kupfer, who's the Vice President for Trade and International Affairs at the BT Group. Mrs. Lydia Stepinska Ustasiak, the Deputy Director of the Department of Foreign Affairs in the Office of Electronic Communications of Poland. Mrs. Lee Tuttle, who's the Councillor in, uh, in the Trade and Services and Investment Division of the World Trade Organization. Mrs. Luisa Brandao, who's a, law a lawyer and the head of the Reference Institute on Internet and Society in Belo um, Horizonte in Brazil. Um, Mrs. Rachel Stelly, the Policy Council of the Computer and Communications Industry Association, CCIA. Mr. Sebastian Belagamba, who's the Regional Director of um, ISOC for Latin America and the Caribbean. And Mr. Bill Drake, who's an International Fellow and Lecturer at the University of Zurich. Um, our remote moderator today will be Mrs. Effie Edo, the co-founder and CTO of Afro Tribune and also member of the MEC. We would like to start this session, as Kenta um, already said, with reports from the digital tracks of both the G20 and G7 presidencies of this year before we have a multi-stakeholder discussion on those issues. So it is now my pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Yochi Ida to report on the digital track of the G20 this year. If I may ask you to please come to the podium. So, good morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Falinga, and distinguished uh, speakers, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is uh, uh, my great pleasure, as well as honor, uh, for me to speak uh, in front of you and to make a short report from the uh, outcome of the uh, G, uh, this year's G20 Digital Task Force uh, discussion. So, uh, 
Japanese government took the presidency of G20 this year, and we had uh, the G uh, ministerial meeting on digital economy jointly with the trade ministers uh, to cover uh, some of the uh, common challenges uh, across uh, trade and the digital economy. But today, I, I would like to focus on the data flow. But this shows uh, the uh, members of the uh, ministerial meeting on trade and the digital economy. And the, uh, uh, because we had the ministers on trade, as well as ministers on digital economy, uh, you see so many ministers uh, in, the, in lines, but uh, uh, half of them are trade ministers. And we had uh, a very good discussion uh, in ministerial meeting uh, held uh, in June, uh, which was passed uh, over to the uh, leaders level uh, at the end of the same month. So before we started the, uh, thinking about the agenda for the uh, meeting, uh, we first uh, thought about the overall purpose of the discussion. And uh, we decided to put how to emphasize and how to share the importance of uh, huge positive impact of digitalization to the to G20 members and as well as rest of the world. So, uh, uh, because you know this is uh, a kind of uh, one of the central uh, uh, policy topics. Uh, policy uh, priorities uh, in, inside our country, which is uh, called uh, Society 5.0. The Society 5.0 is aiming at uh, building up a human-centered uh, digital society in the future. And the concept is to make the best use of digitalization or digital technologies uh, to boost not only the economic growth, but also the development of the whole society. So uh, according to that concept, we uh, formulated the agenda and the topics to be tackled uh, uh, like this. And we put uh, the uh, data flow at the, at the uh, top of the agenda, because we believed uh, data flow uh, or utilization of data is the very much uh, foundational topic for the development of uh, digital economy as a whole. So over the past uh, few years, we discussed, I mean, the governmental fora, uh, such as G7 or the G20, or even more, uh, discussed the uh, benefit and also the uh, challenges uh, brought about by the uh, global digitalization, as well as the more specifically the expansion of uh, cross-border data flow. And we reached a kind of regular formulation of the agreement, which says we promote free flow of information across borders while respecting legitimate policy objectives, or sometimes we uh, use a, a slightly different wording, but we always put uh, our intention to promote free flow of data across borders or information. At the same time, uh, we always emphasize uh, the importance or our respectfulness to the uh, individual countries' uh, policy uh, spaces. And uh, we, of course, understand the importance of uh, respecting the uh, some uh, data protection uh, of uh, policies. And uh, uh, we are fully uh, uh, accept accepting the, the agreement. But when we started the discussion, we thought about why, why we need to put so much emphasis on the uh, respect to legitimate policy objectives uh, in each uh, national policies. What is why the companies are so has, have to be so cautious in transferring data across borders? Why users or citizens are so careful or sometimes even having so much fear in transferring or giving 
uh, their data. And so uh, we recognized, you know, their need to be more trust. That these phenomena are coming from the lack of trust between different stakeholders or between individual stakeholders and digital economy or data transfer itself. So uh, we discussed how to trust in order to promote free flow of data across borders. So the ultimate purpose is promote data flow across borders in order to boost up the economic development and social development. But for that particular purpose, we understood we need to strengthen uh, mutual trust. So after discussing among 20 countries, uh, this is uh, what uh, we uh, reached as an agreement. So this year, instead of saying uh, promoting uh, data flow across borders while respecting uh, blah, blah, uh, we said by continuing to address challenges related to privacy, data protection, intellectual property rights, and security, we can further facilitate data free flow and strengthen consumer and business trust. So in substance, this is more or less equivalent as the previous statement, but the objective of the discussion was how we can understand the way to promote data flow and for that purpose, how we can strengthen trust. Unfortunately, we couldn't reach a very concrete uh, uh, result or a concrete uh, uh, agreement, but what we did was the last red sentence. So we committed, we will cooperate to encourage the interoperability of different frameworks. So we understand different countries, different communities have different situations, different conditions, and different frameworks to regulate or to protect the data. And in order to strengthen, in order to promote the cross-border data flow, we need to promote interoperability between different frameworks. And there is also uh, we, uh, uh, a short uh, Part, uh, saying that we affirm the role of data for development. This is also very important, but uh, uh, today I skip this. Uh, we put, put this aside for the dis uh, discussion for today. So, this agreement was elevated uh, to the leaders' discussion, and we, uh, the leaders uh, agreed on the same uh, substance. And then uh, they also uh, discussed how, how to promote the international discussion uh, over data flow and data uh, digital economy as a whole. Because on, the, on the, the other half of the ministerial meeting, the trade people are discussing how to promote the uh, e-commerce negotiation, which is being uh, promoted under WTO, and uh, they, are, uh, they understand uh, they need to promote uh, the data flow across borders, uh, uh, specifically the data uh, used for e-commerce uh, transactions. So uh, Prime Minister Abe decided to launch uh, initiative called Osaka Track on the sideline of the G20 uh, summit. And uh, 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 leaders from 27 countries gathered together uh, before the summit meeting was started uh, as a, a kind of additional event. And they agreed on uh, launching the, this initiative. 
So the purpose of this initiative is in the uh, lead part to promote international policy discussion, especially to promote uh, data flow. And uh, uh, we believe this uh, initiative will also support the uh, discussion uh, on the negotiation, uh, preparing uh, for the negotiation on e-commerce and the WTO. So let me briefly explain what is Osaka Track. As I said, uh, Osaka Track is uh, uh, aimed at promoting the international discussion on digital economy as a whole or data flow. But uh, we also believe that this will help uh, uh, enormously uh, for, the, uh, uh, for support uh, to the discussions uh, on negotiations uh, on e-commerce under the uh, WTO framework. So this is a kind of uh, multi-layer uh, structure, but as a whole, this is uh, promoting the uh, discussions uh, over digital economy and uh, data flow uh, with the multi-stakeholder approach, because uh, uh, at in any aspect, uh, we believe uh, uh, discussions uh, over digital uh, economy or digitalization should be promoted uh, with uh, different stakeholders. And from that point of view, IGF is uh, uh, one of the ideal fora uh, to, to promote this discussion. So these are the, some of the uh, challenges uh, in front of us, uh, we, which we understand uh, after the discussions. And I don't go into the individual uh, topics, but uh, I hope uh, a lot of discussions, and I understand a lot of discussions uh, similar to these points uh, during uh, this uh, IGF uh, in different fora. And we also expect uh, this, uh, these discussions will be continued uh, in the the framework of IGF in the coming years. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, I uh, pass back to the uh, microphone to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I now like, um, I would now like to ask um, Mrs. Salva Toku to take the floor and tell us about the outcomes of the G7 digital track of this year. Good morning, all, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you so much for inviting me um, to this plenary session. Um, we are very pleased at the French Digital Council to have this opportunity to expose what the last G7 on digital affairs has concluded. What I would like to share with you is our vision at the French Digital Council and how we stand for on how we are entering the, this, this digital society area. Um, first, very quickly, um, let me give you just a little bit of um, introduction about the French Digital Council, who is not really known, and we, and we do are very aware of that. Um, we are an advisory board um, and we operate as an independent one um, for, to advise the French government and mainly provide policy recommendations. We play a strong role in bridging the gap between the tech builders and the rest of the society. We act upon the belief that the citizens cannot and should not be left out of decision-making processes regarding digital technologies. Users, stakeholders in today's world are as important, if not more important, than the economic stakes that come into play. One should not let platforms decide on their own on the Internet's future. The stakes are too big to let them do that. That's the reason why, more than in any other sector, I believe that digital matters have to be decided upon within a multilateral frame with all stakeholders. 
I have participated last summer for the G7 group on digital affairs. I cannot stress enough how important it is to hold spaces of discussion such as the G7, where governments and other decision makers have to engage in a dialogue with the civil society. The 2019 French presidency of the G7 has indeed involved actors from the ecosystem within the G7 process, and that's a very important and interesting approach. However, this is to me just a first step that has to be replicated and taken further in every single international decision-making instance. Multilateralism is at risk in almost every domain of international relations, and the internet is no exception. We all have a responsibility not to give up on multilateral dialogue, especially in the internet, which has represented for some time the utopia of worldwide knowledge sharing. It's only through dialogue and inclusion of all different kinds of voices that we can build digital technologies, not for the sake of building these technologies, but for the sake of truly putting them at the service of the sustainable development goals, at the service of the environment, at the service of the humans. Take face recognition, for example. These kinds of systems and their deployment in various public or private spaces raise very problematic ethical questions and issues. The error rates are still important. The technology still often discriminates against women or people of color, and when you are both, you can imagine. But for what purposes? That is a question which is today almost never asked. And when it is asked, it's usually just between governments and platforms. Civil society, users, citizens are almost never in the room. But that's exactly the kind of stake that we are facing today. We, are definitely need, we do definitely need and desperately need multilateralism and dialogue. This is one of the reasons why some countries of the G7 have adopted a charter for an open, free and safe internet last summer. The internet is transforming our societies in ways that make very specific problems arise around the world. Be it the spreading of hate speech, disinformation, all the rights to privacy and data protection. Building on the Christchurch call, the charters, signing parties, have, for example, agreed to counter illegal content online in compliance with freedom of expression and media freedom. <clears throat> Excuse me. The charter adopts as a basis for internet regulation the promotion and protection for human rights. But what does an internet regulation based on human rights mean? First of all, human rights can seem like an old and traditional concept and practical for our digital societies. That is not true. Human rights are a comprehensive set of principles that we have to fight for and which will completely apply to the internet area. Human rights mean guaranteeing our freedom of expression and fighting against censorship. The right to access information, the right to net neutrality, the right to be forgotten, these rights are all human rights and we need to apply and protect in the internet sphere as well. Second of all, we need to elaborate a new set of digital human rights that builds upon those who already have. This is not a new idea. Usually, digital human rights focus on the rights I have just listed. What we need now is to empower citizens 
with new rights tailored for the digital society at large. How do we translate the notion of equal rights in an area where automated decisions making discriminates against central category of people? How do we ensure that all citizens are treated equally by the technology? How do we embed the very concept of equality within technologies such as algorithm? It is an absolute necessity to formulate and guarantee a right to digital inclusion. Vulnerable population should not be left out of the digital transformation of our society. The need to be on board, the need to be with us. We need to do work, to work very hard, harder and harder on reducing the gender gap in the industry. We need to design better systems that make better, better decisions than those we are make ourselves. Otherwise, what's the point in designing them in the first place? How do we enforce the right to information when automated decision making are usually work like black boxes? The internet has been built on the idea that access to information and knowledge is fundamentally empowering citizens. We need to actually implement that idea into a right to transparency and explainability. Ensuring transparency means, in real terms, guaranteeing people that they are given the criteria on which any algorithm-based or data-driven decision has been made. If I have been discriminated by, against by a machine, if I have been falsely recognized as a terrorist by a face recognition system, how can I access the evidence that the machine has not his wrong? Been, been, have taken a mistake, that the machine is making an error. In the digital society, the right to transparency and explainability also means ensuring access to justice for all. Last but not least, ensuring accountability is a fundamental right in democratic systems. Today, we see social media platforms making decisions regarding political ads, for instance that have an impact on the way our democratic ancestors work. But the big difference is that there is almost no safeguard ensuring accountability of the platforms when they make the wrong choices. In a democratic system, wrong choices are, in theory at least, sanctioned at the next elections. What accountability mechanisms do we have now and what kind of those do we need to create to ensure that the platforms that have a fundamental impact on our societies are held responsible for their decisions? The three basic rights, equality, transparency, accountability, are, as you can imagine, working together. There is no point in equality if decision makers cannot be held accountable when they leave people out. There is no point in transparency if there is no accountability. There is no point in accountability if you don't have any of the other two. Ensuring these rights should be how we create trust for all in the digital area. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for those, uh, for those words. We are here now 50 years after the birth of the internet and we see that new laws and regulatory initiatives that impact data flows and trust are adopted at exponentially increasing speeds all around the world. And this happens now after a long period of 
in action in many parts of the world. And we heard the challenges um, that we are confronted with uh, in the two interventions from the G20 and the G7. At the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, we have launched yesterday um, a new report that is called the Internet and Jurisdiction Global Status Report. And I want to share some statistics with you um, to kick off the discussion. We have interviewed more than 150 key stakeholders, governments, international organizations, big internet companies, civil society groups and other experts. 79% of those stakeholders consider that today there's insufficient international coordination and coherence to address cross-border legal challenges on the internet. And over 90% of them have said that the problems are just getting worse over the next three years. All issues, and this was pointed out um, by the three interventions that we had the, the, the pleasure of hearing until now, ranging from privacy to data access, ownership, online abuses, you name them, they are all somehow interrelated and interdependent. And regulatory initiatives, be they national, private normative orders, declarations, trade agreements, they have ripple effects and spillover effects on each other. The digital trade debate thus cannot be looked at only in the field of the digital economy, but in the larger context of the question of how national laws apply on the cross-border internet, how rules are developed and how they are enforced. So here's my first question to you, and you already highlighted um, the focus of the ministers of the G20 on the interoperability of frameworks. Um, from the G7 report, we heard the importance of the dialogue among the, uh, the stakeholders for an open, free, and safe internet. So, if coordination and policy coherence are crucial to enhance cross-border data flows and create trust among governments, businesses, and consumers, then how, in your assessment, is the articulation of all the different processes, initiatives and frameworks that we observe around the world done today. What are the trends you see? What consensus is emerging? And what are potential roadblocks for, for policy coherence? And I would like to start with um, Tilman Kupfer. Tilman, BT operates in more than 180 jurisdictions around the world. Please tell us how you perceive those issues. Does it work? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, touch on data flows in trust uh, uh, by touching on two points. One is uh, to talk why this is important for BT, and then also why it's very crucial in the trade context. And I'd like to link it then also to the WTO e-commerce negotiations, to which also Luigi Ederson referred to already. So BT is um, outside the UK. Um, we only serve business customers. So we are a global company and uh, serve these customers in 180 countries. And uh, for instance, um, uh, the FTSE 100 are among our, the majority of the FTSE 100 are among our customers, but also in Germany, the majority of the DAX listed com companies. So we serve uh, multinationals from all kinds of sectors, whether it's from the automobile industry, financial services, pharmaceuticals, transport, logistics, a sector you can think of. We also serve international institutions, like from the European Union, and uh, increasingly we have also customers from emerging markets. By running one of the largest global networks, we are also one of the biggest data movers in the world, and when I speak in the trade context, I like very much also to call us a logistics company for data, because of, because of the without the seamless movement of data and the variable environment, the um, supply chains of our customers and the global value chains would stop to function. Our services are basically involved in every single step of the global value chain. When you think about uh, the resourcing of raw materials, if you think of uh, design and development, but also of um, marketing, Sale, uh, shipping, sales and after sales, ICT services are needed everywhere and equally also data. And that's why also the, uh, that what we do as a company is very closely linked to the, the topic of this data because uh, companies want us to move their information assets and their data in a trusted environment and in a secure environment. Increasingly, the digital economy is the economy nowadays. So companies transform their business operations, become more digital in order to become also more efficient. And restrictions 
of data, whether it's data localization or also the, 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 the barriers to the free movement of data, really become a problem for the modern economy. The uh, information economy report of the UNCTAD in 2017 came up with a figure that the global e-commerce sales amounted to $25 trillion. So it's a huge amount. But there's a second figure which is equally important, which is, means that 90% of these e-commerce sales are actually business-to-business -business transactions. And I think that's very important also when we look at, into the future. Because with cloud, with Internet of Things, machine-to-machine -machine communications, 3D printing, and uh, things becoming more and more connected. And um, on Monday, there was a presentation where we heard also that uh, also cows become connected uh, and uh, tomatoes. So the, the amount of data is going to really explode in the future. And most of this data is going to be non-personal personal data. But still, when you look at the WTO e-commerce negotiations on, on the international trade context, the real problem and a very heatedly, heated, heatedly debated uh, topic is the, the way how we move personal data around. So from a BT perspective, uh, for us it's very important that uh, data is moved, in it, is protected, and that the protection of the data moves with the data. And that's why we also uh, support the general data protection regulation of the European Union. And uh, we don't like to call it a trade barrier. In fact, the GDPR offers quite a few tools how data can be moved because there are these, these transfer tools in the GDPR. And um, the problem, however, is that the European Union looks at this from a perspective what happens with the data of European citizens when it moves outside the EU. But companies have to move data in multiple directions, from the EU into the EU and also between the different countries. And that's, I think, that needs to the question uh, that needs to be addressed also in the WTO e-commerce negotiations, that we find some principles for to, to do that. And I'm quite optimistic that uh, a solution can be found. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks. So I know data moves around the world. Everything today is digital, and we can expect the highest growth of the data volumes around the world, not for personal data, but for non-personal data uh, due to the revolution on IoT and other technologies. I would now like to give the floor to Lydia stepinska ustanik um, from the government of Poland. Please share with us your view on, on, on the trends and the coordination of the international system. Thank you, Paul, for your question. Uh, in Europe, we are witnessing growing importance of uh, data economy. Uh, according to European Commission and uh, predictions, the value of digital economy in Europe uh, will achieve uh, more than uh, 700 billion euros by 2020. And uh, it shows the, the, the growing importance of digital uh, economy as a source uh, of, of economical growth and societal well-being. And uh, therefore, it is important to achieve uh, coherence in uh, policy making. But what is challenging uh, here are at least uh, three elements. The first is multi-stakeholder uh, approach, because uh, in our opinion, regulations should reflect different needs of different uh, stakeholders. And as you said five minutes ago, we have an uh, impressive list of uh, 150 stakeholders. Therefore, this process of uh, involving everybody here is uh, so challenging. Uh, the second important uh, component is a pace of uh, development of emerging technologies, uh, which tends to be faster than regulations. And even if Salwa said that uh, global knowledge sharing sounds like uh, utopia, it is necessary to exchange knowledge and best practices across regions. And uh, the third element I would like to mention uh, today here uh, is uh, a deep understanding of interactions between uh, different regulations. Uh, we need a coherent communication and clear vision how to communicate implications to different group uh, of different stakeholders. Uh, I will give you just one example. In Europe, uh, it, it is a subject of a de debate how uh, 
regulation related to free flow of non-personal data interact with GDPR and therefore it is necessary to provide coherent uh, and clear communication to, to all stakeholders, particularly to SMEs that are uh, innovation drivers, but they have more limited capabilities than, for example, global huge players. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, 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 for your intervention that highlight again the need for coherence, um, the future um, direction um, to look at the emerging technologies and how our global data economy will evolve in the coming years when we design policies right now and also to highlight this big issue of legal uncertainty for smaller actors who do not have the capacities to navigate um, hundreds or dozens of markets around the world, different jurisdictions and different laws. Lee, can you give us an update on the discussions on those issues um, from the WTO? What is your view on, on, on the current trends? Well, yeah, thank you. Um, as uh, some of you may be aware, the WTO has is, is got a number of initiatives going on in, in relation to digital trade, or what some people refer to as electronic commerce as well. Um, it's, we, we have a mechanism at the WTO, not unlike many other international organizations, where we try to achieve a certain sense of coherence through negotiation. And that's a very cumbersome process, but I think once it yields some outcome, you, you're sure that you, you have the compromises you need to have had a, a consensus. Um, now, a number of WTO members are collaborating to uh, develop principles on a wide number of the aspects of electronic commerce, from customs and processing issues to... to um, yeah, cyber security related uh, principles, but the one that has attracted the most attention, and as uh, we've noted already in this panel alone, the one that is most controversial and challenging is the discussion on trade principles for data flows. It has two aspects. One is a principle of uh, free cross-border flows of information and the other is uh, the idea that uh, data restrictions, that data must be either maintained or processed locally uh, are undesirable. Now, these principles are, would really be a starting point. I think they're a starting point because the WTO, when they come up with principles, they traditionally do not tell governments how to live up to those principles. They leave it to governments to whether they have existing legislation or need new rules and regulations to go back to the drawing board. That's why continued processes that are multidisciplinary, multi-ministry, um, because of the, the variety of the impacts that, that, and the spillover effects have to happen even if the WTO is able to achieve some outcomes in the area of principles for electronic commerce and digital trade. Um, these principles, if they succeed, would complement existing principles in the WTO, which include, for example, uh, that governments have the flexibility to achieve certain policy goals, legitimate policy goals, often not related to trade such as privacy, such as crime prevention online, and uh, uh, some of the elements of uh, environmental concerns can be achieved uh, even uh, in spite of rules like these. So this is an important aspect of discussion. Now what you have is interestingly, and I think surprisingly to some from what you might hear in some of the panels I've attended thus far this week, it's not a north-south divide on where do we go with these principles and the differences that have come out. There's west-west divide, there's east-west divide, and there's south-south divide. I mean, some of the south countries sound like Europe or the United States. Um, and I think that that is something that we can work out with respect to most issues, the most questionable one right now is the data flows. Uh, some of the differences are quite trivial. Do we use the word, you know, ensure free flow of data around the world or free flow of information? That may 
not be extremely critical differences, but then there are greater differences like um, we don't want to agree to the free flow of data because we want to be able to use it to protect our markets. So that's probably an extreme view, but it, it is out there on the part of some of the members of the South. Um, I think that the trends are not good. Uh, it, this process that we've been undergoing, not only is it cumbersome, as I said, but you also have the sense since 1998, when we first in the WTO concluded uh, a moratorium or temporary moratorium on duties on electronic commerce, subject to a work program, since 1998, there's been this constant sense of fear that people didn't know where the internet is going. They didn't know where the, which way business on the internet was going. And to some, the idea of doing nothing was perhaps, was perhaps preferable to doing the wrong thing. Well, now I think people realize that the, the, econo the, the business and economy and the internet went way ahead of, of them. And there's almost a panic, a sense of loss of control. We have to do something now. The wrong thing could still be done, but we'll see. Um, because I think that the, the, there's an urgency now to the WTO work that people didn't sense before. Um, what are the roadblocks? The roadblocks are the, are the differences, uh, large and small. Um, the roadblocks include things like if, if the WTO concludes some fairly reasonable baseline of standards and principles for e-commerce, there's a lot of very hard work to be done that I think needs to be multidisciplinary, it needs to be multi-stakeholder, it needs to be multi-ministry in the future, because in part, I don't see best practice having emerged to date. GDPR, I think it's an, a, a really good effort. It's a very interesting effort to find a solution. Is it translatable to other countries, other contexts, other legal systems? That we're not sure about. How will it work out even within the EU? That still has to be seen. But that's just one example of the multiple areas where uh, governments are thinking that they need to apply uh, laws and regulations to e-commerce uh, where we have some, some material. We don't have raw material in a lot of other areas. Um, and that will need to be done outside the WTO because the WTO people aren't responsible for cybersecurity. They're not responsible for privacy. They're not necessarily responsible for a lot. Consumer protection, often that's another agency. So I think that you have a situation where the collaborative mechanisms, and I'm not saying that G7, G20, APEC, ASEAN, who are doing a lot of interesting work, the European community, which is, I'm not saying they're not collaborative mechanisms, but you don't have the kind of collaborative mechanisms, I think, in place that work at extremely granular levels on a lot of these areas. And to work in on, on extremely granular levels, but pro, cross ministry, cross disciplines, I think you need to create some new new mechanisms. Thank you, thank you very much for 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 giving us an update and a snapshot of the ecosystem from 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 your assessment. Um, to highlight the pendulum swing that is now happening. Um, the, the pressure and urgency that is felt in the system. And what I found very interesting is that you highlighted that on the one hand, there's a need for principles, but that the devil lies in the details. And um, I think this is very important. And the other thing I think that you, that you highlighted is that this is a trade discussion, of course, but it impacts so many other areas and other areas impact the trade discussions. So how do we do this even on an institutional level or governance level, on organizational level? So, so thank you for, for, those, um, for those remarks. Luisa, you're a lawyer and the head of the Reference Institute um, on Internet and Society. How do you view those issues today? Thank you, Paul. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and enjoy this discussion. Um, they are really uh, complex issues as we uh, see from this panel and we have a lot of different approaches to possible solutions. But uh, what I see working in Brazil and in the region um, is that 
there is a lack of diversity, dialogue and transparency on the procedures for taking next steps. So we already agree that we, go, we need to go further as a global community to global uh, um, solutions on internet jurisdiction, on data flow, ICT products and services. But are we making sure that diverse stakeholders take part into the process? Uh, one, one of the main concerns talking about uh, those devices that Lee uh, uh, previously mentioned is that of, very often we don't have all the stakeholders in the same room with the same uh, goals or the same background to discuss common issues. So one start point uh, for these next steps could be a more transparent and diversity uh, approach of the solutions we currently have or we want to have. Because uh, very often we see uh, initiatives that are uh, interesting that uh, address important issues such as data protection, cybersecurity, intellectual property rights. But they are designed to be global. And not necessarily there is a, a global debate uh, before it goes uh, to the reality, because before it comes uh, into force. And to break these walls that we still see in negotiations uh, and we will need uh, them to go down to uh, take further steps on global coordination. I think it's uh, necessary to bring the different stakeholders, to bring different countries, different perspectives, not just one country or one stakeholder from one uh, region or another, but uh, to be more inclusive as possible and uh, legitimate the future initiatives and um, cooperation that we seek to build. Thank you very much for highlighting those important points. If I want to, to, to summarize this a bit provocatively, we know somehow what has to be done, but we don't know how. And the discussions have to be, of course, inclusive. But how is it then possible that we can discuss every single measure adopted around the world at the global level with everybody around the table? How does that work? Um, Rachel, you're the policy council of the CCIA. Um, your members, are the la among of them, are the largest tech companies or some of the largest tech companies in the world. How, how, how do they see those issues? I think it's on you, you just speak. I'm sorry. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to be on this panel. It's an honor to be among these excellent panelists. Um, as a brief way of introduction, CCIA is an international industry association representing internet services, e-commerce websites, telecommunications providers, and hardware services, all of who export goods and services around the world. And if you'll allow me to state the obvious, the industries we represent have strong interest in the development of rules governing global commerce, including cross-border data flows and the delivery of internet services and internet-enabled goods. Whether it's the provision of business data services, as Tilla described, or enabling SMEs to set up online stores to find new customers across the globe, or providing analytical tools for sellers to reach new markets, or just setting up a social media account that you can reach family or friends across the world, data flows underline all these business models. As such, these companies need rules that provide sufficient certainty to operate abroad and frameworks that still build user trust in their services. Impediments to data, local, to data flows and localization measures and other fragmentation measures have economic consequences and can deter market access for exporters of all size. This is why increased coordination for global rules and on data flows is critical to address trade implications of national regulations and to ensure that different approaches to data governance have aspects of interoperability. With the speed in which data is transferred and the inherently global nature of the internet, this can't be a siloed approach. 
To date, we'll note that some forms have tried to address these challenges, including the OECD and APEC, which have established principles on enabling cross-border data flows and data protection, and these have informed national and multilateral frameworks to digital trade. We are also very strongly supportive of the initiative at the WTO level to set um, rules at a multilateral level, and we're very encouraged by the broad participation of countries. Since the launch earlier this year, we believe that there's up to 86 countries now, so it's important that the number of countries are participating in these discussions. On a bilateral level, I just want to mention the robustness of the US-EU Privacy Shield review process. This is a positive example of an iterative policy coordination. Um, this process demonstrates how um, you, the value of building relationships and align expectations and build trust over time on these frameworks. Um, to address the second part of the question as posed, we do see a number of roadblocks that threaten to undermine this continued cooperation. Uh, we continue to see national measures that have the effect of restricting data, data flows and mandate data localization. Um, as discussed, we often see these measures in the privacy space, but with an increasing frequency, we're seeing them to address national security concerns. Um, the latter are often the most restrictive and don't have uh, mechanisms in place that still allow the cross-border, uh, the transfer of data flows, and they also include quite strict infrastructure localization measures. We'll note that mandated localization measures um, often can undermine, and undermine security and privacy protections by centralizing sensitive information in one place. Um, we'd also note that if national rules um, regarding data protection and security aren't crafted in a manner that provides sufficient legal certainty for these services, they can serve as uh, market access barriers. Um, some privacy laws have had the effect of shutting out smaller firms in a market just because they're not clear of what is required under these new laws, and that's why it's so critical that governments provide necessary certainty and guidance to these, to these services in order to, for services of all size to participate in the global economy. Um, we recognize that countries want to retain country sovereignty to set their own data governance standards, but we still think that there's a way to not infringe upon this principle while still ensuring that valid mechanisms are in place within these frameworks to transfer data while remaining compliant with privacy standards in the relevant market. Um, before I conclude, I want to briefly note that while critical data flows are just one dimension of this data free flow with trust, um, internet services rely on a number of regulatory frameworks to export to new markets while retaining user trust in these services. This includes cybersecurity measures to ensure secure systems, liability frameworks that incentivize services to remove illegal content, as well as con content that violates their terms of service, as well as customs and trade facilitation measures that lower barriers to entry. Cooperation in developing norms across these issues is important to facilitate trade. We're glad that the WTO and other international fora, including at the G7 and G20, is looking at a number of these issues in the context of global coordination, and I look forward to continuing the discussion on the panel. Thank you very much, Rachel, for those, for those comments. Um, um, I pick from that um, um, the highlighting of um, that this cannot be a siloed approach. Um, you also highlighted again a, a topic that was already raised by the previous speaker, which is the issue of legal uncertainties and the issue of smaller actors. And you brought into our discussion also this question of how sovereignty is exercised in an interconnected world of data flows across borders. Sebastian, we heard now from governments, from businesses, we heard from civil society, from the architectural point of view, what has to be done to preserve, enable, and, and further enhance cross-border data flows in the future. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the invitation here. I think the most important point there uh, to, to your question is that we need to preserve the uh, basic principles that uh, guide the Internet. Uh, we cannot uh, save the Internet by breaking it. So uh, we need to find a way in uh, we can uh, at address the issues that, that we're discussing in this panel. At the same time, we preserve the characteristics of the Internet that makes the Internet so valuable for everyone and that produce all the value and innovation, all the, uh, all the advantages that the, that the Internet is uh, bringing to, to everyone. So how to reach uh, that balance is a tricky question. Uh, I think it's important to realize many, many things. One thing I, I think you were aiming at in your, in your question is how we uh, managed to balance a network that has been, from an architectural point of view, has been designed not 
to consider national boundaries at all. Um, a bit doesn't recognize uh, a, a political line. Uh, when uh, at the same time we, we pay attention to national laws uh, and, and we respect both functionalities and both, both architectural designs uh, at the same time. I think one critical component that's been discussed here and that relates to that goes to the last part of the uh, title of the, of the panel and has to do with the trust. I, I think that the trust part of the, of the free follow of information is, is, or data or information is critical to, to, to this. So one thing that I, I find important is, is uh, to replicate in, in, in a way the origin of the internet in, in that way and that the internet is in itself is, uh, is based on trust. And there is a collaborative way to address and to, um, to generate that trust among, among the, all the participants. And that has to be, when, when, you, when it comes to dealing with the internet and the, and the consequences of the internet, I think that uh, perspective needs to, be, no, be needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed in a way that uh, we all are involved, we are all included in the, in, in the discussions, there are multiple actors that are involved in the operation of the, of the internet. I mean, there is no centralized way to, to rule the internet in, in any way. So uh, the different uh, stakeholders that are involved in running the internet need to be part of the, of, of the solution, of the way forward for, for this. Uh, we strongly believe in a, the, the, in, a, in a collaborative way to preserve the trust on the, on the internet. I, there are four uh, factors that need to be considered here, which is a uh, user trust, technologies for trust, uh, trusted networks, and a, and a trusted uh, and trustworthy uh, ecosystem. All of them need to be considered in when when you think how to apply uh, rules in order to preserve to preserve the trust on on, on the way it works. And there is two. I would like to to, to point to. Two things that, and two trends that we see at block roads in, in this, uh, in this uh, regard. Um, the so called uh, lawful uh, access solutions and a filtering mechanism, a mechanism to encrypt uh, an online content. Uh, we see both as a, as a critical thing that needs to be addressed because uh, we are not going to achieve the free flow of information if we don't preserve that, if we don't preserve. Um, these uh, critical characteristics of, of the internet, trust is going to be a road, and then all the things that we're gonna, we're gonna do are going to be uh, a road uh, accordingly. Trying to circumvent the basic encryption of the internet will weaken the internet in a way that will not make it useful anymore. Uh, we'll uh, get to the point that we are risking breaking the internet, as I said uh, at, at the beginning. Filtering in general is not a good idea on the internet because it can be so, uh, circumvented and creates more problems than, than solutions in general. So I would say that a strong uh, encryption as a foundation of uh, data free flow with trust is crucial to the functioning of the digital economy, as is being reflected in the C20 uh, recommendations this year. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for stressing the importance of, of, of trust and bringing into the discussion also the issue of, of, of encryption and, and also telling us a bit about how the architecture is of the internet is organized through collaboration and who knows, maybe there's a thing or two to learn even for the policy making of the challenges we're confronted with now. Before we give the floor to Bill Drake, um, Thank you for your patience here in the audience um, and also the people who, who follow remotely. We want to now, after this invention, open up the discussion. So please think already about your questions um, and prepare maybe short statements. I'm sure you have um, very interesting things that you want to ask our, our great panelists here. So you can already start lining up at the microphones or prepare your online questions. Um, and we will come to this in just a second. Bill, you have written extensively about the ecosystem, the different trends. As of 2019, what's your assessment and where, where, where are we going? Who knows, but thank you, Paul. Um, good morning, everybody. Happy to be here. Uh, the, the broad questions you've asked could be taken in a number of different directions. We could talk about coordination among privacy actors, among people involved in law enforcement uh, and access issues, etc. But I'm going to focus on the trade part because that's 
what I'm particularly interested in. Some of what I have to say will resonate with what Lee said. Some of it will maybe diverge a little bit. Uh, and since I'm the last speaker, I guess I should try to be a little provocative in five minutes. So I will make just four points. Um, first, as a, and I say this with apologies as a political scientist who studies international negotiations, um, coordination and coherence can only be achieved when, there's, when the strategic structure of incentives among play, players is reasonably symmetric. Unless the relevant parties have sufficiently compatible interests and in negotiating preferences to make credible commitments, even the most creative institutional design of the process will be insufficient. In digital trade, this situation does not obtain on a broad multilateral basis. So the only option has been to pursue smaller and uh, plurilateral negotiations among the willing. Um, this has led to a proliferation of free trade agreements uh, outside the WTO uh, with varying levels of consistency amongst themselves amongst themself and with the WTO basic rules such as the general agreement on trade and services. And then even among the coalition of the willing, you've got, as Lee indicated, all kinds of cross-cutting divisions. There's a highly variable geometry of disagreement. It's not just global north and south. There are differences in every direction. Secondly, the joint statement initiative that's currently being informally pursued under the WTO roof has gained momentum and has attracted a growing number of developing country participants. Nevertheless, the, the prospects for reaching agreement by the June 2020 WTO ministerial meeting seem rather cloudy to me. Half the WTO members are not participating, including much of the developing world, and a few thought leader countries like India and South Africa remain adamantly opposed to negotiating an agreement. Given the prevalence of thinking like data is the new oil, um, and the repeated stated, uh, stated desire of some countries to pursue policies like data localization that are incompatible with the preferences of other countries, it's very difficult to see how we move forward on a really broad basis. Transatlantic differences over privacy protection, wider disagreements over national security exceptions, the applicability of existing trade disciplines and so on, all raise a lot of challenges. So my guess would be that we end up with something like a OECD plus agreement, some industrialized countries with some friendly developing countries, but doing something on a much broader scale is going to be very difficult. Third, I would say trade process, and this is where I maybe diverge from Lee a little, trade processes alone are not sufficient to bridge the differences over the governance of the global digital economy. Monthly closed door uh, meetings of trade officials who repeat long-standing and incompatible positions and then go home cannot solve the underlying differences in preferences that percolate into the trade system. Despite the failure of prior related secret negotiations, like the Trade and Services Agreement, governments remain wedded to this approach. They're going to do the same thing they've always done. The lack of transparency in the process, even on the design of principles and norms, not to mention any negotiation of actual national commitments makes it impossible to draw in new ideas and expertise and build the societal support you need to make agreement uh, and convergence possible. On the whole, this situation seems unlikely to change very much, although some countries have at least consented to publicly posting some of their input documents. So fourth, and here's my main point, I believe that parallel tracks of intergovernmental and multi-stakeholder dialogue are needed to work through the complexities of digital trade issues, increase the level of consensus that would be needed in order for the WTO to succeed. Greatly enhanced intergovernmental cooperation is needed in the G20 process, which is institutionally underdeveloped and has not been sufficiently leveraged by governments, perhaps in conjunction with the OECD, UNCTAD, and other partners. We need more transgovernmental uh, cooperation among national regulators in a variety of different issue areas that are touched on by trade negotiations. But in parallel, we also need multi-stakeholder dialogues. Alongside the G20 process, going beyond the B20 and T20 discussions, and in separate uh, uh, forums like the World Economic Forum, the IGF, others. These settings are less pressurized than the WTO, 
and could allow governments and stakeholders to explore ideas, inter alia and inter, uh, internet governance issues, and uh, build more consensus on core issues like data localization and data barriers, et cetera, and how do we assess, for example, what constitutes a legitimate public policy purpose for restricting data, what counts as a measure that is not more restrictive than necessary to serve a legitimate purpose, and so on. These are things where I think the trade negotiators by themselves just can't get it done. We need a multi-stakeholder, interdisciplinary community of expertise and practice, like we had 20-something years ago when the whole trade and services process took off. We had a global epistemic community of experts that really fed in a lot of creative and important ideas into the process that made this work. That doesn't exist now. People are too divided, and it's a real problem. And I would say, finally, uh, in parallel with the expert-level processes, we need mechanisms to promote broader public engagement. And that's where processes like the IGF come in. So for me, the, the trade process is important. It needs to go forward, but it needs to be nested in a broader nexus of, of cooperative relationships with more information flow, more coordination, so that you get convergence outside the trade negotiation room that will then feed in and help the trade negotiators work more effectively. Thank you both for sharing those, those four points with us and, and for your call for, for more coordination and coherence. And, and I, I, I like very much also um, um, the point you were starting with, which is this prism of, of looking at this debate. What are the incentives for, for, for coordination, for cooperation, for the different actors around the world? Ladies and gentlemen here in the room, um, dear remote participants, um, the floor is now open. Let's have a dynamic discussion. I see the first person um, over there. Please, in, in, please introduce yourself to, 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 to everybody One, two. here. Yes. Uh, Bertrand Petit, you know, Cherche, a think tank in Paris on uh, AI and uh, cyber security. Very interesting debate. Uh, what appears from the outside that there is a catch-up game on uh, regulation uh, towards the digital economy, and uh, which circulate around two issues, uh, data, data ownership, data protection, and uh, software. Okay, software, how you make the software cyber proof, uh, watch proof, uh, what is inside of your product is safe and so on. So as we watch all over the world this debate, there are some pockets uh, who are moving faster, especially on the IoT, which is uh, the driverless car. And those people will see if they go to this end, but they come up to the decision that uh, in order to build a safe driveless car, mm. you will do it on open source, mm. okay? So in view of the urgency uh, in this world, uh, how do you promote open source? Do you see it as a solution? Because in fact, it's the only transparent software you can have and you can audit. They are not perfect, but they are transparent. And they have proven very efficient in the digital space for innovation. Thank you very much for this question. Are there, are, are there other questions in the room? We can, we can group um, a few questions. Yes, please. Uh, I'm from Brazil, and I'm a MA researcher on global governance on the internet. Uh, my question goes on the, um, more of a comment too, uh, goes on the way to question the idea of an OECD plus agreement, since uh, OECD has been always something that was being uh, an exclusive group and an economic group. Uh, how can we make sure that a, pa a global pact of, on the internet or something like that can encompass the most problematic countries such as Iran, such as Russia, and such as China? I think uh, this could mean more fragmentation in some ways, but also uh, predominate the model, American model of governance uh, that it's already <laughs> something that uh, exists. So my question is, how can we negotiate with countries such 
uh, with alternative measures on the internet that is the, they are the main offenders right now. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Yes, please, from our remote participants. Online question. Uh, first one. What are the initiatives about international technology standards? Second one. For all the panelists, are data protection regulation in general a form of notary protectionism used by countries which are falling behind the data economy race? Thank you very much. Is there a third question as well? It's okay for now. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, dear panelists, so we have questions on open source, on OECD plus and fragmentation, international technology standards and data protection. Who wants to go first? Well, Bill? In saying OECD plus, I didn't mean to coin a term. So let's just be clear. <laughs> <laughs> this probably make, that makes Lee's skin crawl. Uh, let me say this to, to your question, the gentleman from Brazil. I think that really broad-based harmonization on a broad multilateral level around trade issues is going to be very, very difficult to achieve. It's just the reality. If the differences between the domestic systems and preferences of China, United States, Europe, and you mentioned some other countries to which we could add India, South Africa, and so on, are fairly substantial. And, you know, it used to be that they tried to negotiate uh, trade deals like in the Uruguay round uh, as a single undertaking with a broad, nothing's done till everything's done, and you bring everybody along on every issue, every topic, et cetera, and you do trade-offs among the different issues. That model is very, very hard to do today because the differentiation of interests among players has grown so substantially. Living in Geneva, I hear all the time from certain international organizations and NGOs that everything is about the global north and the global south. And I feel like it's 1975. It's the same discourse that we were hearing back then. But the reality is the global south is extremely heterogeneous. And what works for Brazil may not work for Lesotho. What works for India may not work well for Nepal. Everybody's preferences are quite different. And so, you know, as a first step, I think the, the most you could probably realistically expect is try to get those parties that are willing to make a commitment into a group and then see if having done that, you can grow out access to the benefits from that and encourage others to join over time. But it's a, it's a progressive process. I don't see how you get a big bang negotiation that results in, you know, the whole world coming together and singing kumbaya, given how completely different the views are. And Lee can disagree with me if she wants. <laughs> Any other reactions? Yes, please do. I'm sorry, I can't, can't say much on open source. But um, I just want to follow up on what you said also about um, how we can look at in the WTO on countries which are a bit more like-minded. And I think uh, if we find ways to bring them together, I, I mean, Lee also mentioned the West-West divide. And the OECD made a good study recently, which was published earlier this year, looking at the areas which different approaches countries take to data localization and data flow and personal data protection. And, and I think if you look at the EU on the one hand and on, on, the, on the countries, blocks of TPP countries or CPTPP countries plus the US MCA countries, on the, one, on the one side, they, they take different approaches, and um, the EU has a more precautionary principle, as we can see also in the REACH regulation, for instance. Uh, so they want to make sure that companies put all the systems in order before they can move data cross-border. And uh, so we have these different transfer tools in place there. Whereas um, the other countries, the other side, takes a bit more liberal approach. However, both want the data to flow in a protected way in the end, and both, both also, also are opposing forced data localization. So I think if we can bring them together, that could be a good way. And, and I believe there's a chance here because um, the general, general data protection regulation has different transfer mechanisms in place so that data can flow 
in a protected way. There's an interesting case for Japan because the EU and Japan found an adequacy agreement mutually. They both consider both uh, data protection regimes adequate, pro offer adequate protection for their citizens. However, that adequacy finding was done outside the trade agreement. It was negotiated in parallel. And in a multilateral context, uh, finding an adequacy finding will be not possible. So we have to think about other ideas. Lee mentioned the discussions around finding common principles. But that, that doesn't work for the EU because the EU doesn't want to negotiate a fundamental right in the trade agreement. So we have to get, think another step further. And I think the, if we could find an agreement that does two things. One is to restrict data localization. And the second one does um, require that countries who adopt data protection laws offer in those laws a workable solutions for companies to move data in a protected way based on the country of origin. So the data would flow with the protection offered by the country where it comes from. Then we can have uh, the, the flow guaranteed in multiple directions. And the benefit for this was it was also create a common level playing field for companies because they don't need to compete with other companies who have to obey to a lower standard only. It also would avoid the need to negotiate a, a common lower level of, of principles only. And, but in, in parallel, of course, we, we still need to have more dialogue also with data protection regulators so that uh, regimes mm. become a bit more aligned over time. But also, it would be very helpful if the trade experts and the policymakers in the trade area would talk a bit more also with the data protection community, because there's often a lack of understanding between the two. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is one of the, the, the most recurring um, um, topics in all of your interventions, is this need for bridges between the different policy sides to address those fundamentally transnational, fully integrated and interconnected issues. Would, would, would some of you like to react to, to, to the questions and the, the, um, the reactions, um, the first reactions by Bill and, and by Tillman? Yes, please, Rachel, and, and then Lee. I just wanted to follow up on the, the question on the inclusion of uh, more authoritarian, authoritarian countries in the discussions and whether agreements can be reached at that. I'll note that China is at the table at the WTO JSI uh, Joint Statement Initiative. Um, I think that it makes, makes relevant the point that whatever is agreed upon at the WTO level, we're seeing some submissions um, at the WTO level and also in other trade negotiating contexts where there's quite extensive exceptions and the exceptions to the presumption on free flow of data in these texts are quite broad and um, pretty much render the uh, presumption um, meaningless. And so a number of the texts being proposed are self-judging in nature, and that could even conflict with uh, countries' national laws that have, en have enabled mechanisms that transfer data flows. So I think that um, making sure that the exceptions in at the WTO aren't um, crafted in a manner that will undermine the cooperative process. Thank you. Lee. Well, just briefly, I think we need to remember that OECD is a lot broader than it used to be itself. But um, I think Bill's right in the sense that uh, at least initially, if anything can be done in the WTO, it will be the kind of thing that perhaps people who are not ready now could sign up to it later, if that happens. Uh, yes, Russia and China are both sitting on, in to the negotiations, but that leads to one of the questions, if, if people like Japan and the US uh, with the highest ambition, you might describe their positions as highest ambition, see that the, uh, some of such countries cannot join with the highest ambition goals, does that crash the negotiations? I don't think there's been a sense that the negotiations will go ahead you know, without major economies not agreeing to some very basic uh, internet and data flow related provisions. That's just a prediction that, that worries us quite a bit. Um, the other thing quickly is that um, 
I think the comment I'll pick up on, on non-tariff barriers. I work for the management of the agreement that in fact was one of the first big experiences dealing with non-tariff barriers, the services agreement, because we didn't have tar uh, tariffs. So in that sense, I think those of us who, who have followed services watch these e-commerce negotiations very slowly, very, very closely, seeing how challenging it is to deal with essentially trying to interlace people's different domestic regulations. But we have seen it happen in the past. We have seen ways that governments can be convinced that there be comfort levels. But you often do need to bring the different regulatory communities into the room, something we did in the Uruguay round of trade negotiations. We called it a sectoral testing ex exercise. We brought different uh, ministries uh, in to actually talk to one another in the WTO building. Something like that may be necessary now because there's a lot of talking going on in capitals, but let's say the central bank people from capitals aren't talking to one another specifically on trade and what's going on in Geneva, um, but they're talking directly to the trade ministry. We could use a lot more interfertilization precisely because we're talking about non-tariff barriers for the most part in e-commerce like we did in services. And I think it's doable, but it, it is a multidisciplinary uh, process. Thank you. Any, any more reactions? Are there further questions in, in, in the room? Yes, please. And please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jean-Claude Goldenstein. I'm a tech entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, but I'm originally from, uh, from Europe, from France. Uh, Salva talked about the, uh, the spread of uh, hate speech and disinformation. And I'd like to bring up the challenge of hateful deepfakes uh, that would be spreading uh, fake rumors. Uh, we're just at the beginning of this, and there's been um, and covered in this uh, in this conference and in general and in, in the press, which focused more on on uh, deepfakes about politicians, not enough about business leaders, um, organizations such as yours that will be victimized by by deepfakes. So uh, Sebastian talked about um, tools to improve trust, and my question is: if AI cannot reliably fact check deepfakes. What are ways do you guys see to quickly contain the spread of doctored video before they hurt leaders and, and brands who are basically funding you know, the, the social networking platforms? Thank you very much. Are there further questions? Otherwise, I would give this back to the, to the panel. So I think that's a great example of how interconnected all those discussions are. Here we talk about WTO and trade, and there's a question on AI and deepfakes, but that is the reality we live in. Those are not theoretical discussions. Um, this, this level of legal uncertainty um, among businesses, operators, consumers, um, and even regulators um, is our present. What, what are your thoughts on, 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 on that? Bill, please go ahead. So, you know, um, there's a lot of progress being made by people in the AI community in developing means for detecting deep fakes, but it's an arms race. And so for every, every uh, bit of progress you get from people being able to map these things and, and find small differences, you get then the guys who are producing the deep fakes upping the game to the next level and, and finding a way to trump that. So this is a, an ongoing cycle. So just relying on the technology by itself may not be sufficient. We, mean, we may need to have some sort of a network for alerting people to uh, bad information and sharing warnings, et cetera. I don't know how that would work, but look, let's just take one example. Remember the, Ru the Rwandan genocide, how much just rumors spread on radio helped to drive people to acts of great violence. Imagine now that you could do deep fakes, not just with somebody speaking, but you could actually do deep fakes that show circumstances, that a city, a village that supposedly has been attacked or something like that when it hasn't. Um, and that can spread very rapidly. There are a lot of very volatile places in the world where the possibility of digital wildfires taking off 
and having really you know, nasty effects, uh, it, it's a real thing. So we are gonna have to devise solutions that are not just relying on the technology, we're gonna have to find some way of establishing a mechanism for information sharing, alerting, and, and having rules for takedowns and, and corrections, et cetera. Nobody knows how to do this yet. Maybe Sebastian does. He's with the internet. No, no, no I, I don't. No, actually, we're in the core of the internet, not in, in that layer. But one thing that is important is not, uh, about what you're saying is that that relates where it's not fake news are not the other problem. Real news are also. Hey, that that village might have been uh, being attacked. <laughs> so uh, and and the, the spread of the of the news at that pace would be a problem, even if it is real. Not only in the case it's fake. I mean. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that I think is important. Another thing is my, my, my use of trust. I mean, I, my use of trust related to the, pro to the process in which we, uh, uh, we uh, get along in order to, to, to find out ways to move forward and not in the case of fake news in, in, in this way, just that wanted to, to, to make the distinction. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? We have time for one last one because other, well, I also have a question that I would like to ask our, our panel. If that is not the case, I would like to come back to, to, to the two initial statements that we had on the, on the G20 presidency and the G7 presidency. And if I, if I take just one word um, that summarizes um, the G7 um, statement, it's the need for interoperability. And, um, and, and um, from G7, from, from your um, um, presentation, there was a very strong uh, emphasis on the need for dialogue. And we also discussed basically that there's an emerging consensus or we start to understand that we need to have integrated global solutions, but the question is, how do we build them? And I want to, to ask you one last question. If you, if you would have a recommendation or, or an opinion on how can we really strengthen the interoperability between the different regimes, the different frameworks around the world, so that we ensure that they are at least compatible, if not fully interoperable in the future. Um, do our coordination efforts scale fast enough to, to and, and what can be done? Maybe I would like to ask each of you to, to give us one takeaway, um, one recommendation of the direction in which we should go. Yuchi Ida, maybe um, you can start. Thank you very much. It, it comes, just, just keep talking. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, in my uh, opinion, uh, we don't recognize or we don't formulate uh, the uh, freedom on the network and uh, trust or some policy uh, objectives. Uh, we don't want to put these two things uh, as a kind of dichotomy or trade-off. But we believe, you know, these two factors uh, should go hand in hand uh, and uh, strengthen each other together. So uh, uh, the uh, adequacy uh, 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 admission uh, by, uh, between uh, EU and Japan is one of the good examples. And uh, uh, even if uh, we have different frameworks, uh, we can reach a kind of uh, some interoperabilities. And uh, uh, we believe uh, we always need to ask uh, different stakeholders uh, what direction do we need to go because uh, when uh, we think about the principles or regulations or some of the uh, some abstract uh, uh, requirement, uh, but uh, the government do sometimes do not understand the reality of technology or reality of uh, uh, users' uh, conditions. So we need to understand uh, the, uh, what uh, should, should work uh, in the real situation, and uh, uh, we need to reflect uh, them uh, in the uh, policy uh, uh, formulation and uh, also uh, the negotiations or discussions uh, uh, with the different uh, governments or different stakeholders. So, so uh, my uh, answer is very simple, but uh, uh, the, uh, what we need to do is to keep uh, discussions with multi-stakeholder approach. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. If I can pass on the microphone. Um, thank you, Paul. Um, very, very 
complex and tricky <laughs> question. <laughs> um, for sure that we have to continue the dialogue, but um, the emergency or the issues we are facing maybe need something a little bit more than only dialogue. Um, when at the French Digital Council we do urge people to um, gather organization or every, um, every type of organization of civil society, um, we urge them not only to dialogue but to write the roadmap that is needed for the principles. And I do agree with Mr. Oishi that, um, yeah, most of the time, unfortunately, governments really do not understand what's going on. And for us, it's one of the main problem. So maybe we have to be from the civil society, and I think I will be, it's not really diplomatic for me to, to, to say it right now, but I will. <laughs> Um, I think that civil society have to be over the governments on those, the dialogues, roadmaps. I think that if some governments do not understand that they are helpless, they don't have to be at the table. They have at least really have to understand that they have to listen to the experts, the civil society with gathering to try to create I will not say the, perf the perfect roadmap, but at least one that is taking care of everyone. That's what I think. I won't come back to Paris. It will be <laughs> thank you very much. Tillman. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I mean, I think uh, as we have seen also from the kind of questions, but also from the discussion here and also from your uh, statement at the beginning, uh, all different topics are interrelated, even if you just look at one aspect, which is uh, data flow and trust, because it's about human rights, it's about censorship, it's about aspect access to information, but it's also about trade and about uh, the protection of, of, um, uh, of, of uh, fundamental rights. And, um, and when we look now just only at the, the trade aspect, uh, I mentioned already that um, it would be really good if we bring the data protection community and also the, the trade community together so that they get a better understanding of what's actually possible and what's needed. Because um, in, the, in the trade community, often there's a lack of understanding why data needs to move and why personal data also needs to move. Uh, but fortunately, if we look at the, at the GDPR, we have the tools at hand and that's often at least at the beginning of the discussion, was not really recognized by the trade community. So um, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't have to be a barrier. And also data protection is not a non-tariff based barrier. Uh, because um, if you apply to everybody without discrimination, that, that can also work. So and then I think without, in, instead of thinking about how to agree on a common set of principles, and, and going into the national data protection laws of each country, yeah. we should require that every country which has a data protection law offers the possibility to move the data in a protected way and where the protection of that jurisdiction moves also outside the boundaries. And that would already stop countries to argue, yeah, for the sake of data protection, we have to store it locally, which is, doesn't make sense because you can protect it also outside of your jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Lydia, what's, what's your view or recommendation on the future of interoperability and, mm -hmm. and coordination? Okay. To be frank, I don't see one tool or one way that will be able to solve uh, all problems with interoperability. Uh, but uh, I believe that the good way that is able to move us forward is a constant cross-regional dialogue, is an ongoing process of consultation uh, on different levels, uh, local, uh, cross-regional as well, involving different groups of uh, stakeholders uh, like 
like public sector, private sector, public administrations, SMEs, uh, and also academia. And uh, what I would like to expect from such a dialogue is not only a harmonization of different regimes, but also possible reduction of uncertainty and uh, enhancement of trust which is necessary and uh, what also appeared many times in our today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Lee. Hi. Yeah, well, I, I think the question from Monsieur Silicon Valley is, is symptomatic of the idea that the era of not regulating what's happening over the internet is, is definitely over. So if we're going to regulate it, I think we're talking about a whole host of communities, a whole host of parallel processes. The question is how do these parallel processes feed into each other? Is there some kind of a mechanism that can create avenues of liaison between civil society discussions and the discussions of say central banks or cybersecurity people and trade people, that would be ideal, whether a mechanism are, is formal or informal. Another thing I think about is the fact that I have seen, if rules are going to have to be made, what are the rules of the road? WTO is trying in a very, at a very high level or, or a very principal kind of way of looking at that. If you're going to look at the bigger details, I see a model in something that I think has been very useful and, and successful. If you're familiar with the International Telecommunications Union, it has a global symposium of regulators. And what has surprised people there is that people um, really share experiences, not just through the panels, but they're sitting there talking about, well, how did this, this regulation work for you? How did this uh, uh, new pro project work for you out in the hallways and in the coffee shops? Um, another example is, for, is the way internet and jurisdiction, for example, the people you work for, has been working. Is there a way that internet and jurisdiction and, and regulators uh, can feed into what each other are doing, find ways to inform one another, a place like a global symposium of regulators that's multi-sectoral and that involves civil society intending in some way, involves organizations like yours attending, so that people are all cross-fertilizing. I think that would be helpful. Is it too ambitious? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Luisa, and... and um I think it's okay if we overstep the time a tiny bit. I think we also started five minutes, but we just need to keep the time also. Okay. Uh, so I, I agree in this, uh, with these ideas that we have uh, um, to figure out some steps uh, so different stakeholders can, can follow. It could be uh, steps for a dialogue, for a, coming together and feed also the public opinion as Bill said to to bring it to the to the meetings uh, to reflect what are the the goals uh, of that society what are uh, the reality uh, they faced um, of course it's impossible or it's uh, super hard to understand or, or to imagine uh, a context where we could uh, discuss every single de detail, and this is not the point. The point is to establish at least common frameworks uh, or principles that involve not just governments, but also cross-regional and the national players uh, to, to establish those uh, steps or further procedures. Thank you, Luisa. Rachel. I'll be brief in the interest of time, but um, we think that trade will continue to play an important role in these discussions. Just as national regulars step up their scrutiny on the digital economy, we think that existing uh, trade trade commitments, um, it needs to make sure that regulations are commit with, with those in addition to looking forward to the future to seeing what the WTO can agree on at the global level. Um, in addition, we also see other fora, including the OECD, UNCTAD, IGF, as 
critical forums to develop a lot of evidence-based policy analysis and civil society perspectives to feed into these trade discussions to reach solutions. Um, on a specific level on interoperability, um, we know that emergency re regimes could have more success in promoting interoperability by focusing on developing systems based on principles of accountability rather than an over-reliance on differing perspectives on consent-based mechanisms that are, can differ from country to country and um, are quite complex. Um, and I think I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Sebastian, please. Yeah, just to reflect that um, this uh, data flow, uh, it's, uh, it's happening just because of the, the, the existence of, of the internet. And even though the internet has some uh, things that we need to consider, for instance, uh, the, the pegs or things like, things like that, I think there is an agreement that the internet is uh, first for good in, 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 a, in our lives. So when we discuss this, let's keep in mind that the vehicle that we're talking about is the internet and that we don't have to break this thing that makes our, uh, our life uh, better every day. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, would, I already expressed support for greater transgovernmental regulatory cooperation, so I'm, I'm down with Lee's new body uh, for, for regulators. But more generally, let me just say, we're all governance geeks. And because we're all governance geeks, we all want to think that there's some magic institutional mechanism that we can envision that will suddenly promote better interoperability and coordination. But you know, it doesn't matter whether the table is square or round or you tell people that they have to stand on it or you know, anything else. If the member states' interests are being def defined domestically in ways that are highly divergent. So what we need is again, a global community of expertise and practice that will promote greater convergence of concepts, ideas, and so on. If you listen to people in Washington, D.C. talk about data localization and barriers to data flow, it's one party line from all the think tanks, all the industry associations, it's very fixed. Same thing in Brussels. Then you go to Delhi, you hear something completely different. And what, and what people are talking about in a lot of the developing countries, you know, the data is the new oil, we want our oil, all this, it really is divergent. And they're getting advice from international organizations telling them that data is the new oil and you should resist any cooperation. So, you know, we need to do something to facilitate broader multi-stakeholder dialogue that is not just among trade negotiators, that really probes into these things and gets at why countries feel the way they feel about the digital economy and the way that they want their governments to uh, play a leading role in it and try and build some consensus there. Until you do that, you can round tables, square tables, three level tables, it's not gonna matter. Thank you very much and, and I think my personal takeaway from, from, from this session is the issues are really complex. I think we, we managed to map out the different facets. Everything is interconnected and interdependent, and at the same time, the stakes are so incredibly high for the future of the cross-border internet and our digital societies and economies. And um, I like the word magic that you use because I think this is also one of the takeaways that I take. Those, those issues will not go magically away. We, we need to deal with them. And this is why I think it's fantastic that um, um, the G7, G20, WTO are coming to an internet governance multi-stakeholder forum and that there's a big equal that all of you here say that um, the multi-stakeholder model and multi-stakeholder discussions can provide a pathway to bring together the different policy processes around the world, the different perspectives, the different stakeholders, um, so that we have the necessary coordination for cross-border data flows in the future and for future generations. So, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much. And um, I hope that this will be a discussion that um, we will continue. Thank you.